screencast. Now, I have recordings of the past lectures. They just haven't kind of gotten the right form for them to be posted. I'm hoping to do that today or, or tomorrow. Um, they are rather large, but um, hopefully if for someone's really interested, they should be able to, to find them of benefit. Okay, so um, last time we had uh, noted that agent-based models are distinctive from stock and flow models that many of you are familiar with uh, because of their inclusion of a variety of a large modeling vocabulary. It spans everything from, from events to issues of, of uh, subtyping, relationships between what we call classes, um, uh, different ways of describing dynamics, uh, state charts, as well as stocks and flows and, and custom, um, custom Java code, and a variety of mechanisms for interagent communication, et cetera. Um, and I introduced this so-called ODD protocol. Um, stands for Overview Design Concepts in Details Protocol that was uh, formulated by a set of very experienced agent-based modelers, particularly in the ecological area. And originally, it was designed as a specification protocol. How do you describe agent-based models in a concise, precise way? But also um, has been tied in with some of the issues of how do you have a, a sensible process to build up these models. So we talked last time about the first component of it, the O within the ODD, um, standing for the, the overview. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the latter two of these uh, design concepts and remaining elements but I'm gonna to try to go over them very, very quickly. I tried to orient us uh, last time as to how these things fit into the broader modeling process. I noted that modeling is an iterative process. Um, this is true whether you're dealing with system dynamics, or modeling of stocks and flows, or agent-based modeling. You've got uh, a series of stages that a model goes through, and there's iteration back and forth. So during model calibration, you may discover issues with your model formulation. You go back and you change that formulation. But broadly, a model becomes more and more well-defined, and more and more you develop you know, greater and greater confidence as you go to the right here, and you end up using the model in these later stages. I noted that agent-based modeling, in comparison with, with classic system dynamics modeling, has tended to focus predominantly in the later phases of this. There's just not as much discussion um, historically on the problem conceptualization side and qualitative mapping. So in system dynamics uh, classic area, you see um, uses of group model building, for example, participatory modeling in a way that really isn't been emphasized in agent-based modeling. However, I'm trying to orient the agent-based modeling process using this, this broad flow because I think it applies very directly to it. The ODD protocol that we introduced last time um, has a mapping to this uh, process as well. So the, the uh, overview stage and the beginning of the design concepts phase really relates to sort of these two early stages, problem conceptualization. What are you trying to solve? What are the reference patterns uh, of interest? What are What is the scope of the model, the <coughs> boundary of the model? We distinguish three components of the boundary. Does anyone remember what those were? When we try to describe elements um, that may or may not be in a model, we, we introduce three categories. Who can mention what those are? There were endogenous and exogenous and ignored. ignored. <laughs> um, very good. I don't very want to well, I, I, uh, you'll find me often doing that. Uh, <laughs> and it's a challenge both to remember and to read. So, so this is exactly right. Um, so the point is to make these decisions consciously. In an agent-based modeling, it's even more important to do it because the, the flexibility of the framework in describing detailed processes is, is uh, great. It's very rich. And we have to be very conscious about what we want to put in so we don't end up putting so many things in that our understanding is, in fact, obscured. Yes? So I'm wondering how that interplays with when you're actually thinking about heterogeneity of agents. Yes. Yes. And you start to think about agents that consider actual different variables and decision making. Right. So, um, so, so this is a very good question. Uh, broadly speaking, we have to distinguish between um, issues that we put in structurally 
versus um, cases where we have a given structure and we're simply making it heterogeneous. Um, so for example, this modal scope and boundary at this level is predominantly an issue of what variables and uh, parameters, what, what considerations, as it were, are you including within your model? Now, within an agent-based framework, um, given a certain um, set of variables that are captured, say, within agents or within the broader environment, it's very straightforward within the local environment. It's very straightforward to then make them heterogeneous or homogeneous. That is not a, uh, a decision which affects the structure of a model within the agent-based context. Um, let, me, let me emphasize that again. Uh, in, in classic uh, aggregate modeling in a stock and flow context, if you want to distinguish different levels of, he of, of heterogeneity, if I want to break down the population, say, by sex, or I want to break it down by age, or I want to break it down by income level, that actually has material structural impact on the model because I need to introduce subscripts. And uh, those subscripts are defined over large portions of a model. So if we have a, a stock and flow components of our model that we need to break down across it according to age, for example, that needs to apply across all the stocks there, across all the flows. And so that's a weighty decision. That's a decision that we often will be thinking about earlier in the process because there's a fair bit of work involved in changing it later. Um, in an agent-based context, if you have agents which are associated with certain properties, and, and I'll, I'll use that term to denote both state, aspects of state, things like uh, you know, things that might be changing over time. Broadly, you might think of it as including age, but things like uh, you know, income level might be changing over time, education level, um, people's uh, weight might be changing over time. And uh, properties would include those. Properties would include things like pr things that are more parameters, their sex or their ethnicity, what have you. We can very easily introduce heterogeneity into that without modifying the structure of the model. It's, it's uh, literally um, trivial to do. And we'll see how we do that either late today or um, in our class next, next Wednesday. So heterogeneity is less of an issue here. What's more of an issue uh, from an agent-based context uh, issue, uh, from an agent-based perspective, is the issue of behavioral uh, flexibility or richness. Um, to what degree are you trying to capture, for example, agent learning from their environment, agent adaptation of their behavior to the environment? I'll distinguish those two later in this lecture: um, learning versus simple adaptation. Um, that's something you want to think about earlier because. It, it could have a significant impact on what, uh, what state, for example, might need to be maintained in the environment. If you want to capture someone's adaptation of their behavior in response to the characteristics of the environment surrounding them, you need to start keeping track of those aspects of the environment. Um, so, so here, behavioral richness is an issue that we'll have to start thinking about at that point. And what I argued last time was that in an agent context, um, you'll find uh, that while the models can be as rich, can be arbitrarily rich, and we can very easily go down that, that direction, for the sake of learning, it's often best to ask, to, to wield a very sharp scalpel. You know, John talks about, John Sturman talks about using model purpose as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity. And you'll find full agreement with that in the agent-based modeling literature. Start simple with a model, build it up step by step, adding in components so that you have some measure of understanding about which component that you're adding in yields which type of behavior that you're seeing. If you start with everything in there, it's very hard to untangle their effects. There's so many moving parts, so to speak, with respect to each agent with respect to the broader system, that it's very easy to just kind of throw up your hands and say, I don't know where this behavior is coming from. It's just coming from everything. And that's just not a very useful thing when it comes to learning. So, so the, the general sense is, look, if you're trying to characterize a phenomena in the external world, um, start only with those things that you're absolutely convinced it would be 
uh, ludicrous to to examine without them. That you couldn't pass a red a red phase test, and then work up from there in a step by step way. Okay, um, and I have some slides on that which are now posted on the Stellar site, which you might want to check out in that regard. And I'd be glad to to talk more about it. Um, so also delineated at this area is sort of what are our entities? And entities I included agents, but also aspects of the environment. So in an agent-based context, we often have the environment um, that's built up into a global environment, which affects everything in the model in a kind of uniform way. I argue taxes, regulatory sort of you know, rules that, that apply every, to everything in the model. So what's a local environment? Locality is very important to agent-based models. It's one of the big motivations for, for using these models because it affords us a way of describing how people's behavior depends on their localized perceptions, which is often very important. Um, you know, research has shown that in case after case, people don't have perfect knowledge of the world around them. Their knowledge is disproportionately affected by those <laughs> in their immediate vicinity, whether it's spatial, or whether it's in a network sense, their their sort of set of no, uh, social connections, for example, will disproportionately <laughs> impact their ideas. So these early stages here, and then going to qualitative problem mapping, where we're using qualitative state charts to de to describe people's progression among possible states. We're using we're delineating what are parameters and state variables would be that we're interested in. This. You know, bearing on the heterogeneity issue, uh, qualitative uh, uh, causal causal loop diagrams or influence diagrams, which are recognized within the, uh, the agent-based modeling literature, and you can have some interaction diagrams between agents. How do they interact? How does one agent interact with another? Not in its full detail, but what sort of things by which one agent might influence another? So a you know a hunter in our, in our model might might. Uh, you know, pursue uh, a deer and uh, might uh, kill a deer, might retrieve it. And so there might be a couple different kind of verbs by which they interact and we articulate those. And then we define the model time and spatial extent. How broad amount of time are we talking about? I argued la this time, last time that this issue of time and space is, is largely determined by the emergent behavior of time and capture. In contrast to any time step, or spatial step, a sort of size of our spatial environment into which we quantize things. The, the model time extent and spatial extent is often um, motivated by the desire to capture effects uh, over a certain scale, you know, to have the intergenerational effects really show their, um, uh, show their face, et cetera. So these these broad areas have to do with the O and, and the first part of the, the, the D, the design concepts. Later, we're talking about more detail of design concepts and in the final D, the, what, what is known as the details in the entire specification, which have to do with um, a variety of specifics we'll get to, a sort of grab bag of, of issues that have to be specified within a, within a model. So. We talked the last time about the overview, the O containing the model purpose. And I'd include in here the very critically in an agent-based context, the patterns that you're trying to explain. The, the thought is that even more so than in a system dynamics context, classically, we have to begin not only with a broad purpose, but with some um, some patterns that we're trying to appeal to that capture either qualitative or quantitatively observed um, character of the, the phenomenon we're trying to deal with or the problem we're trying to deal with. Because without that, we have too broad a space of models that we could explore without a lot of constraints to clue us in about which model is more realistic. So model purpose within an agent-based context specifically embraces pattern-oriented models. And those patterns are often over space and, and, and uh, over topology, over a network, in addition to being over time. Over time is familiar. What do we call patterns over time in system dynamics modeling um, with, that we might start with to start building up a system dynamics stock and flow model? What do we call those? 
Yeah, dynamic behaviors and reference modes. Um, those are very common in the system dynamics literature to try to, to try to motivate the construction of a model as part of model purpose, to try to capture those, explain those perhaps. Um, here, we have broader set of patterns because they include these additional dimensions of space and of, of topology. Okay, we then defined the key elements, the entities, the, the environment and the agents within it, the states of those entities. And this is, uh, this is the terminology from ODD, which includes both parameters and formal changing state. In the scales, the uh, some sense of kind of the, uh, the, the, whether you're simulating this over a day by day basis or year by year or you know, decade by decade, second by second. Um, what, over what sort of scale are you trying to capture things? And then I talked about, in addition to capturing the state, the characteristics of agents, as it were, and of other entities, what are the processes that apply here? We're not looking at this overview stage to specify all those processes unambiguously, we're often just saying there will be a process of partner change, for example, associated with sexual contacts, or a process of, of uh, needle, um, needle exchange, which is occurring in different, um, uh, different shooting galleries for people sharing, sharing needles, or a process of, of, of uh, quitting and relapsing in a smoking context. We leave the full specification of these to the later stages, the detail section of the model. So that was our overview. We then talked about um, uh, this in, in more detail. This is what I wanted to talk about today, which is at the model formulation stage. And it has to do with the later components of ODD, the design components. And last time, I handed out a sheet, which some of you, uh, it sits before some of you. I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, which talks about a number of issues related to model formulation. Um, questions that you should be asking yourself about an agent-based model to help, shape, to help shape it, to help make sure that it's capturing um, the full set of considerations you may want to bring to the table. Um, so uh, in the model formulation stage, we're going to be specifying the model increasingly precisely in terms of its uh, details, in terms of state charts, what do state chart transitions depend on? We saw state charts last time, um, but when we deal with them at the qualitative mapping stage, we're often whoa, abstracting over the details of what fires in a transition. What leads to a transition being firing? Is it a, a fixed amount of time you're in a state? Is it a fixed chance per unit time of transition to the next state, or does it depend on how long you've been in that state? Does it rise, for example, with the amount of time you've been in that state? These transitions need to start to be increasingly precisely specified in the model formulation stage. And by the end of that stage, they should be fixed down, OK, what, what are my assumptions going to be about state transitions or about flows? So in the formulation stage in system dynamics, or specify how do flows depend on the stocks of, the, of our model. Ultimately, it's the stocks. They typically depend more, more interme you know, on intermediate variables on the way and that, that in turn depend on other stocks. So here we need to do the same thing. And then there's a, thing, a set of things called observer processes. These are the outputs we're interested in from the model. They're the things we want to collect on which we wish to collect data. So we have this rich model with perhaps multiple populations in it. What do we want to look at from that model? What do we want to want to gain insight into? What do we want to save away as data in a database? What do we want to look at in terms of graphs or tables? We typically have a set of observer processes within our model that are quite different from what we have in system dynamics. In system dynamics, what do we typically go in with a stock and flow model? What do we typically go and look at to see changes over time. What are we looking at in graphs, for example, or tables? We're looking at what? So if I'm in Benson and I'm interested in how my model is operating, I'll call up a graph. <coughs> Typically, it's a graph of what? Stock. Yeah, it's a graph of a variable in the model, right? It could be a stock, it could be a flow, it could be a 
an auxiliary variable that's the sum of several stocks, what have you. Now, in an agent-based context, you typically are going to be having um, a set of outputs that you're interested in that are going to be aggregations. Not always, but they're typically going to aggregate over different subcomponents in the model. And generally speaking, you're not going to have a ready-made variable that captures that for you. So the process itself is going to gather data, perhaps in different subsets of the population. Um, maybe, for example, in all diagnosed diabetics. You're going you're gonna to go out there and look through the population, and we'll see how to do this in great detail in one of the next few lectures. And it will count the number of people out there in the population who are diagnosed diabetics and it will then allow you to report that. Or maybe the observer process is keeping track of the number of people who have been infected with TB you know, over the course of the past year. It's not as easy here as just going and clicking on a flow, you know, flow number of infections per year, and just viewing it. Instead, we often have processes that we have to kind of describe that will go out and collect that information for us. So delineating these is, is, is important. Um, asking ourselves, what do we want to observe and how are we going to collect that information? Um, and then we're going to have to think about what's our source of model, model parameter values. Um, where, where are we getting these from? We're going to talk about that more and many of these things more in specific lectures, but I wanted to give this overview so you can situate particular topics within the modeling process. Now, in addition to thinking about the behavior of agents in isolation, we need to ask ourselves, how do agents interact? How do agents interact with each other and with the global environment? Um, so sometimes you have conditional processes. For example, an agent doesn't start transmitting until they're infected, right? Um, Agents aren't just constantly shedding uh, some pathogen. They have to be infected before they start shedding it, before they can transmit it. Um, you might have you know, reporting taking place at the very end of the day, and, um, and only then you know, firing, as it were, the reporting process periodically. Um, so you know, agents may, for example, note the status of agents around them and then perform updates to their location. So they note oh, several agents around me are infected, I'm going to flee. And I'm going to bop over to another place in the space to flee. So these are examples of sort of interactions of processes. Um, so we have uh, perhaps a movement process, and it depends on state of, of those around us as determined by another process. So what other processes does... Do the, um, one, uh, if you're considering a process like agent mobility or agent infection, what other things does it depend on? Um, what, is it, what is it contingent upon? Um, I think I'll skip this right now. We'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, I want to get through this pretty quickly. And I want to focus on design concepts. Yes? Okay, so observer processes are a subclass of processes. Processes are, you know, sets of, of behavior operating over time, and um, observer processes are specifically behavior over time which is involved in observing the model and gathering data, typically for output purposes. Um, so for the purposes of reporting, reporting to the modeler typically, and where that reporting may be instantaneous in the form of a graph or a table that's sitting in front of you, or it may be just squirreling it away in a database and for later, later inspection. So an observer process is a type of process, but it's epiphenomenal. What I mean by epiphenomenal is that it's not modifying the behavior of things within the model. An observer process, it, you can think of it as kind of a dead end process. It doesn't change anything in the model. All it does is observe things. All it does is is uh, collect information on things. It doesn't itself change the behavior of anything in the model. Does that make sense? So I can add these observer processes into this model um, without fear that it's going to change the model dynamics. But 
I want to plan generally around what these observer processes are. What is it I want to collect data on? Because that, among other things, it may affect what I put into the box. Like what processes am I simulating in the first place? Um, and you know, it, it may it may also have an impact on sort of how I represent um, how I represent the information I'm trying to gather. So we'll see. There's a couple ways to keep track of of agent changes of behavior, for example, or the current status of the model. We can kind of laboriously go through the population, counting people of a certain characteristic, or every time someone changes state, we can keep track of the fact that they've changed state. Okay, and Sometimes we have to decide between those ways of representing things. Um, so we'll, we'll be seeing that. Um, OK, so the, the second component of the ODD um, is design concepts. Um, that's the, the middle D, um, the first D. So uh, here we're talking about considerations that need to be consciously thought through uh, while you're designing a model, while you're sort of deciding what goes into it. And these are quite specific to agent-based modeling. They're quite, um, there's some overlap with what we have to think about or what we would do well to think about in a classic stock and flow context. Um, but there's a lot here which is quite specifically agent-based. And part of it is kind of philosophy and part of it is, is uh, it reflects the kind of richness of the modeling, uh, the age-based modeling paradigm. So this is what was described in that sheet I circulated. And if anyone hasn't gotten that sheet, let me know, and I'll, I'll send along a copy. I should really be sending out copies which have the source listed. It's from the book, which sits in front of Todd there. Todd, could you raise the book a lot? Thank you. So it's, it's this book here, which is the reference book for the course. OK. so. Um, Within, uh, within this space, the design concepts, it actually begins with, somewhat, somewhat uh, oddly perhaps, um, in terms of the name, design concepts. Where did the principles come from in underlying this model? I mean, where did this model come from? What, what was it motivated by the, the, the representation of certain things? Did it come from other models that are published? Was it stimulated by certain papers? Basically, um, identify any sources of inspiration for the models, a matter of documentation. But then it gets into certain considerations that you need to go through in your mind. Um, the first of them is, is uh, really emphasized within agent-based modeling, and that's the issue of emergence. To what, deg to what degree are the results that we're seeking to observe um, arising naturally out of a myriad of interactions, interactions between agents and agents in its own state over time? And to what degree are these pre-programmed? To what degree are we kind of presupposing the results we're seeing, and to what degree are they are they emerging in a kind of organic way out of a large number of different um, diverse interactions? Within agent-based modeling, there's a conviction that wherever you can, it's best to try to aspire to capturing phenomena as emergent behavior rather than kind of programming into the model. So there's a real hesitation towards simply, for example, um, putting into a model, let's say, um, so uh, 12, 13 years ago, I was working in the tobacco-related modeling area. And we had a quite articulated system dynamics model uh, in, in tobacco, where we had uh, rates of uptake, initiation of smoking, cessation, and relapse of smoking over age and over um, and, and according to different aspects of heterogeneity. We had this in the model, um, and generally speaking, it reflected the fact that, uh, or if you looked at the rates there, you know, people tended to uptake in youth. There was a, a, a span of a couple of years that were particularly key um, in the teenage years, typically, and then it tended to drop off. If, if you weren't a smoker by 21, 22, you're very unlikely to become a smoker. Now, often it was even earlier cut off than that. Similarly, cessation rates, what do you think they did over time? Do they start high and go low, or what is cessation? Your chance of, of quitting smoking in a given year of your life, do you think that 
goes up or down or stays the same with age? Okay, down. And uh, so you would think it might go down because Okay, so there are some effects um, in the 20s where you see that. People who started smoking then decided, well, <laughs> maybe this isn't so good an idea. You know, um, it seemed good at the time, but, but I'm going to change my mind. But what you also see is later in life, it starts to rise. And, that, and that's, a that's presumably reflecting health issues um, that come about because of it. Um, it's also reflecting changes in your social context um, that may be occurring. So you're seeing your friends who are smokers struggling with health problems of their own. It's not just your own. Um, and similarly, relapse rates um, uh, will differ over time, although it's less obvious. So, you know, uh, we program those rates in. We just kind of put them into the model. Within an agent-based model and context, there'd be a real push to sort of say, well, to what degree are these representative? Are they emerging from some underlying factors that you really want to capture? For example, cessation rates may be reflective later in life of, of health concerns. Maybe you want to start with those and just have the cessation emerge from that um, rather than being pre-programmed in, you know, what the likelihood is. Uh, similarly, if you over time have higher rates of risk of diabetes by age, you know, maybe that's a reflection of some accumulation process that itself needs to be reflected. So the next thing is adaptation. We'll talk about that. Sensing, objectives, learning, prediction, interacting, stochastics, and observers. So I'm just going to go through a subset of these right now. Uh, we started with um, emergence, but I'm going to, um, maybe I'll, I'll just comment on that. So there's a, a viewpoint in Asian-based modeling, and it's articulated uh, most clearly, as I've heard it, by Josh Epstein, um, who's now at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was at Brookings for many years. And what he argues, so he has a book, uh, Generative Social Science, which is a very interesting collection of pieces on age-based modeling as applied to um, issues involving social science, uh, and a variety of types of issues. And what he argues for is a generative perspective. He says, look, we don't really understand phenomena until we can generate it. So if we have a phenomenon that exhibits certain patterns, we can't truly say we understand how it works unless we can reproduce it at some level with a simulation. And um, it's a perspective you'll see elsewhere within the agent-based modeling area. We want to explain these results that we, or explain these patterns that we see, not simply build them into our model. So we're trying to ask here, to what degree are the results of the, or the, the patterns we see in the world resulting from interaction of factors? Um, and to what degree can we kind of capture them by building in a set of very basic factors whose that interact in rich ways. So we saw this last time, you'll recall, that spatial SIR model. Remember that model we saw? What was an emergent pattern that came out of that? The waves, the waves of infection that emerged from it. Um, quite distinctive. Um, uh, I argued that they, that they have a sort of phenomenological uh, regularity that, that uh, is quite pronounced. And Yet they emerge from a very simple set of assumptions about how agents interact just with their neighbors within this very regular space. So in short, we had a very simple way of reproducing a very complex phenomenon. And much of agent-based modeling is motivated by that observation. Small pieces interacting can, uh, small individually simple pieces interacting can yield very rich phenomena over space and over time. And agent-based modeling tends to be hesitant about simply pre-building patterns into your model, um, building in the, the quit rates and the, the you know, cessation rates and the relapse rates and the uptake rates and imposing them on your model and more pushes you towards can you explain them. Now, you have to, within your model, pick your battles carefully and sometimes you end up building them in 
but you do so consciously with an understanding that maybe later I've got to go back and then look at that as an emergent phenomenon. So here's some emergent behavior that um, we saw. So this last time, um, although with different parameter values, and here's some emergent behavior with prions. We didn't expect this. This was a, a model that actually came out of a class I taught last year of chronic wasting disease. It's one of the models. It's a potential project to extend. Here we have these these uh, mule deer uh, running around. Some of them are dead, the black ones. Some of them are alive at different stages of their life. And they're shedding. They're shedding these prions, which are misfolded proteins, which can be highly infectious. And we had been dealing with a system dynamics model, which approximated the average number of prions per unit area over the space. And it abstracted away from water sources. It abstracted away from details of of uh, how the deers went and fed. And once we had a model where, coming out of this course, where deer feeding behavior was captured and deer water seeking behavior was captured, it reached out and struck us in the head that, look, we have huge concentrations of prions in certain areas, particularly in the lakeshore margin here, and very little in the interior. We're trying to represent sort of a mean prion concentration, an average prion concentration over the entire landscape, it's going to be misleading, particularly where you have a dose-response relationship that's non-linear. Um, you may be really underestimating the amount of risk because here you've got a lot of areas which are very, very little risk and then some areas which are huge risk. And there's a big difference sometimes between looking at the dose-response relationship for the mean versus the mean of the dose-response relationship for those two areas. So this is an example of an emergent pattern that came out. It's one that we could cross-check. It's one that we could collect data on through sampling to check. Here, here's an emergent pattern within a uh, multi-level model. So here, this is one of the models that provided um, on the website. Here we have individuals. Individuals are in cities, um, and the individuals are located in space relative to one another, and the cities within these, I think that actually this was motivated by farms and animals within them. But here we have outbreaks which can occur in a big way within one of the farms, but the movement to other farms is quite, quite limited. And so we have sort of real uh, heterogeneity at the farm level that's quite different from what we see at the individual level. So we have kind of um, different levels of analysis. And this is the sort of thing which might be examined for those of you who know what I'm talking about with hierarchical linear modeling or something. You might do a multi-level statistical model to probe what some of the effects are at the farm level as opposed to the individual level. But again, you might have distinctive patterns of risk at each of those levels. Um, and emergent patterns, yeah. So the example that you gave about smoking where you've got the rates, yeah. how did you end up solving that? Um, so uh, for that particular project, it was, it was a system dynamics model. We considered going agent-based direction, but uh, the, model, the model ended up just sort of remaining in a system dynamics framework. Since that point, there have been people who have done that. Um, so uh, I particularly mention a Brookings study uh, from uh, Los Angeles schools where they were looking at, uh, this is in high school, and they were looking at um, progression of individuals in their social networks and the degree to which um, social network effects may be driving some of those behaviors. And if you're interested, I could, I could give you a report on that. I'm less interested in like, the subject of smoking yeah. than the like, methodological way of getting right. around the problem. Right, right. right. So, um, uh, what what you'd have to be asking is okay, you know why is it, for example, in that you see such predominant uptake where what is it eighty percent of uptake occurs before age eighteen or something like that? Why is it you see that in those teenage years? And that's what they were focusing on, and they they took a model which had features that our model didn't. I mean, ours was a system dynamics model which was broken down, stratified by age, sex. Um, we looked at ethnicity, but we ended up not putting it in, um, and uh, one or two other factors, and and yet it didn't have connections between individuals. It, it didn't even have a mixing sort of matrix about who mixes with who, you know, um, younger students with older students or anything like that. 
Um, what their model had was actually a, a detailed representation of the social networks involved, as I recall. And they were looking at how the, um, the spread of, of memes towards smoking, attitudes towards smokings were impacted by those, those networks. Unfortunately, this is a work that wasn't uh, uh, widely published, but I know the, one of the key investigators on it and um, have spoken to him about it. So like a broader yeah. point would be Yes. Where the emerging behavior is coming from, and exactly. then create the constituent parts so mm -hmm. that you can kind of test that hypothesis. Precisely. So we're talking here about when it comes to um, explaining these these emergent phenomenon, of of trying to generate it from kind of a what what sometimes the terms that are sometimes used is um, uh, mechanics of kind of the underlying system, or you also hear the term physics of the underlying system, kind of for for how the the underlying phenomenon will be interacting, you have a dynamic hypothesis for how it works. It may not be a privileged hypothesis, but it's a best guess. And you end up investigating whether that could drive the phenomenon you're seeing at the level you're analyzing it. Um, and, and so you are trying to explain those patterns, as you say, using constitutive relationships at the next level, level down. Right? And the challenge is th that, that Todd referred to is very much here because you can't do everything in your model. It's an opportunity cost, right? You put your effort into one thing, you look at social network effects, maybe you can't look at the effects of you know, differential media access at different ages or look at effects of uh, you know, the impact of smoking on people's pocketbook or something like that. And this is one of the reasons why you see an awful lot of highly stylized agent-based models. And we'll see some of those in the class. But I uh, give us a classic example of this, and one you could go run on your, on your uh, model, and one we'll feature in a, in a lecture, is the shelling segregation model. Um, uh, Todd may be familiar with this from an urban planning standpoint. But what it shows is it's not, and, and this is a really important distinction, folks. People have in mind the idea that a model is trying to reproduce the external world. And this is particularly seductive and tempting when it comes to agent-based modeling because we can so readily capture within our agent-based model so many phenomena. It's tempting to say we can have it all. We can, we can characterize how things are out there in the world in all its vagaries in as much as it relates to our question. And that is a, an aspiration that is um, often really daunting, even when you have a very basic question. In some cases, you might be in a situation where you can actually attempt it. But often what you're attempting to do with these models is not to try to create a reproduction, a simplified reproduction of how things are in the world, but instead to ask clear, well-defined questions about whether we can reproduce, for example, certain phenomena using very, very simple assumptions so that we could, we can put aside very complex um, uh, explanations as by Occam's razor is kind of unneeded. We can say, look, we have a very simple explanation that may be underlying this phenomenon, and let's go collect data, see if, see if there's data to, to, to support that. So a shelling segregation model, there's a very simple model that, that shows that uh, suppose you have people located in space and those people have a small preference to being, those people are distinguished of two types. You know, you can think of people of two different ethnicities, people of two different cultural backgrounds, two different language groups. And let's suppose that you have a slight preference for those in your same group. So I, I prefer to speak with those who also speak Canadian and well, no, okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, eh? um, no. So uh, so suppose there is a slight preference. And maybe it's you know, uh, I I have a ten percent greater preference. Maybe I have a two percent greater preference, you know, all of the things being equal, if there's two neighborhoods, um, I'll gravitate to the neighborhood with a slightly <coughs> slightly larger fraction of people like myself. Um, it turns out with a very slight preference, you can get really striking segregation patterns emerging. The idea is people will pick up and move to be with those who are 
those neighborhoods a little bit more like them. And by interaction of people's choices, you get clustering. You get, you get um, patterns emerging, regularities emerging at a higher level that are the type of thing we see with segregation. It's, you know, you have large areas which are predominantly one group and another area um, quite s strongly delineated, which is another group. And you have these sort of patches that emerge. And as you tweak the amount of preferences for those of your group, you get different patterns emerging, um, different different sizes of those patches. Yeah. Um, oh, good question. Sure. So, um, let's say that you get segregation. Yeah. At two percent, but you also get it at four percent. Right. So. I just think that very fine the model given this extremely high sensitivity is very daunting. So I, I, I'm sure it's a case, case by case basis, but how do you make sure that you have the right values given that the diverse so Right, right. Okay, so this is a, a great question. It has a lot to do with the purpose of the model. Um, so first of all, I want to distinguish between two broad sets of things here. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a divergence, but I think it's an important question, so I'm going to try to handle it. So you want to, you want to distinguish between two types of issues. One is verification, one is validation. Um, have we built the right model versus have we built the model right? right. Um, so you know, we, may, we may have in mind a certain model, and we make a mistake in implementing it, right? That can happen. There's a bug in the model, so to speak. Um, and traditionally, we think of that as an issue of, of verification, about whether we built the model right. A, a deeper issue is validation. Have we built the right model to answer our question? Or have we built a useful model to answer our question? Is it, is it a meaningful, is it meaningfully capture what we're, what we're setting out to, uh, to, to capture about the external world? Now, for these highly stylized models, 2%, 4%, I think that could be an issue of false precision, where essentially, look, you know the model's so stylized, it's not trying to depict you know, Baltimore, the emergence of segregation in LA, or, or what have you. It is, it is an attempt to, to capture, to see whether certain broad patterns of spatial um, assortment, a division of people into groups, can be captured through very slight preference differences? And the answer seems to be yes. And, and to ask what, what level of preference applies in the broader world, you would need to consider other factors that are not considered in the model. I'll give some examples. You need to consider residential um, steering. So where, where a real estate agent steer people towards neighborhoods which they think are more appropriate for them. And this, there's, a, there's a, a literature on this phenomenon that's uh, quite clear that there's a fair bit of it that goes on. So, you know, you interview with, you go, you express your interest in moving to a city and they've done controlled experiments of this sort where, you know, a, a person will arrive in a city and go to a real estate agent and depending on the ethnicity of the person, they get shown different regions. They get shown quite different regions of the city. That is also operating when we look at segregation in LA or segregation in Baltimore. Um, another phenomenon that's, that's operating is differences in income levels among, among the group. And that's not in our selling segregation model. So if we wanted to ask within, within the observed world, what is the level of preference people have that would, both, that would best explain patterns of segregation that we have, that would require a model that's much broader. And there we'd have to really sweat that difference between 2% and 4%. But we need other factors added in because those factors are contributing to the phenomenon within the model. W within the, what I'm saying though is that not all models have to aspire to, to representing how things are in the world perfectly to be useful. You can have a model that's known to be wrong, but is useful for generating insight about what some of the drivers might be in the broader system. And then you would take the findings from that model. Okay, small preferences could have a big impact. 
we really need to think about building that in as a phenomena in a richer model, right? Um, on the other hand, you may find small preferences have no impact in some models, in which case you can kind of put that aside as a modeling goal, okay? So I don't know if I've addressed your question, but I've, I've, I've tried to, to, to comment on some issues. So, so yeah. I mean, it seems like this is a, 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 so I'm thinking of it as a modeling for insight versus modeling for prediction. Precisely. Yeah. And it seems like that would be, yeah. of, of all the things that you would have to state early on in the O, mm -hmm. in the purpose of your model, That's right. that would have to be first and foremost. That, that is the key thing. So in terms of model purpose that even transcends the issue of what patterns to which you have recourse, mm -hmm. that issue is, are you modeling, are you trying to aspire to reproduce um, at, at some uh, fairly articulated level what processes are operating out there so you can predict with some measure of confidence the trade-off between policies or the um, the likely evolution over the next n years you know of the external system um, are you trying to capture those things which sets a very high bar or are you trying to instead gain insight into how certain factors may be interacting to yield certain of the observed phenomena without trying without pretending to try to capture the full richness of factors out there. Huge difference and a number one issue to consider in the O stage. And it, it's worth emphasizing because a lot of people these days think about models for prediction. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of the motivation for it. But it, it requires commensurately larger investment. Investment in time, investment in data, investment of you know understanding of the processes driving it. And often we can gain great insights from models before that data is available by modeling for insight. So um, grateful for your question. Okay, so another phenomenon um, really uh, emphasized within agent-based models is the issue of adaptation. We can build in patterns of agent behavior that are independent of context. I mentioned the smoking example. I am, so I have a certain chance of starting smoking per year, and that, that's that for my age, and that's what it is. Um, it might be, uh, you know, I have a certain level of mixing with others when it comes to uh, uh, exposure to airborne pathogens or an individual might have a certain um, amount of, of sexual contact with others um, over time. Uh, so a certain number of, amount of partner change. Now, those things can be programmed into a model very readily as statistical patterns. Very straightforward to do in any logic. Um, and it has much to recommend it in terms of ease of, of explanation. But when we do that, we want to consciously think about are we missing something important here? Particularly the degree to which that behavior depends on other factors in the model. For example, aspects of the global environment. Um, you know, so is where I'm located going to materially impact my degree of exposure, for example, to airborne pathogen? So if I'm in a poorly ventilated, low-income home, Am I, do I have the same level of, of uh, exposure to pathogen as I do in a you know, well-ventilated, state-of-the-art, uh, lead gold standard building? Um, uh, and similarly, uh, to what degree is my behavior like to be shaped by, by other agents? So is my level of um, circulation exposure to pathogen going to be independent of how many agents, how many of my friends are, have gotten, have contracted H1N1 flu? Or have developed, um, who have been hospitalized you know, because of that? So within an agent-based context, we have the capacity to easily represent at a mechanical level how behavior depends on these things. And the question is, is that in our model? Do we want it to be in our model? It may not be, it may not be a priority but we want to make this decision consciously. And we want to document it so we can revisit it later. Just as we did with the endogenous, exogenous, ignored. Um, 
this would be something that fact is factored into that issue. We're ignoring the effects of, you know, uh, social, social um, uh, health health issues within our social environment. Um, so the question here is: To what degree is agent-based behavior sort of robotic, based on well, that? That's a disservice to robots. Um, uh, to, to what degree is it kind of um, uh, fixed, pre-programmed, hardwired, independent of context? And to what degree is it depending on aspects of the environment around them or aspects of other agents? So um, part of this links the issue of sensing, and I should have talked about this. What, what data, what information do agents gain from those around them? What do they sense? Do they sense anything? Or do they simply move with abandon across the landscape? <laughs> um, you know, with no sensing of anything. So, so these deer, um, hey, come on, where, where's, my, where's my nice model there? Um, there they are. These deer do sense something. What do they sense, do you think? Food. They sense food and they sense water. water. That's right. So they're not going out on this ice. Um, well, okay, it's ice at this time of year. Um, uh, they're not. They're not going out here. Um, they they stop at water. They stop at food. So there's some measure of sensing involved. Um, and hunters, if you were to represent them in this model, um, uh, would sense certain things. So they'd sense a deer at a certain range, for example, and might move towards that deer with a certain measure of speed um, on their quads or what have you. Um, so. Uh, so here we have um, uh, issues of, of sensing that need to be considered. And an important question here is, you know, uh, sensing is imprecise. It's error prone. Hunters make terrible mistakes sometimes, where they mistake a person for a deer. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be delayed, right? You can have sensing going on, but the information is old by the time you act on it. You want to kind of think about it. Um, so uh, it's also to what degree is it localized? How far can you see that deer from you? Um, how far in the social network do you hear about someone's illness that might motivate behavior change when it comes to smoking, for example? Um, so adaptation has to do with uh, with the sense data, and you know we have to ask how does behavior depend on context? There's sort of. Uh, um, I think I'll leave this to another time, but there's, there's several different levels in which we can build patterns into the model. Suffice it to say that a lot of the goal here is calibrating or, or trying to match patterns that we see um, as emergent patterns. But you can build in patterns directly into the model. You could just pre-program in people start smoking with this rate, stop smoking with that rate. Or you could say, okay, we're going to build in some dependence of the likelihood of starting to smoke based on those around us in the model. Um, and so you have sort of some functional dependence of behavior change on some external conditions in the model. Um, and you can get things at, at different, uh, different levels here. Okay, so um, I think I'll drop that. These are some examples you might want to look at, but we don't have time to go into them. Um, there's one type of uh, one type of behavior change or way of uh, which behavior may depend on environment, which is particularly notable, and that is where behavior is shaped by some objective that you're trying to maximize. So, in classic depictions of rational agents, where agents make decisions that that um, gain them the greatest advantage, um, it's it's traditionally tempting to represent choices in the, the choice between different decisions as a kind of utility maximization, trying to maximize your satisfaction with your choices. And so there's a, a model, for example, of driving behavior that came out of MIT here, the, the civil engineering department, where people's movement through a city is represented in the agent-based level. Previous models had represented uh, patterns of of um, uh, car movement, um, in many cases with differential equations. So you had partial differential equations, a flow of traffic, and you think of traffic as kind of flowing as a as a liquid would, right?
right along pipes and so on. But those sort of models didn't really capture some salient effects. The fact that there are these phenomena where you know people will be unsure what lies ahead of the curve in front of them, so they'll slow down, for example. Or people will use the, the tail lights of the cars ahead of them to determine when to brake and when not to brake. Localized perception, for example. And if you wanted to take into account how people chose which routes they're going according to tolls and according to the amount of time it takes and the amount of traffic involved, um, uh, the safety issues, um, you could make use of something known as discrete choice theory, uh, which is an approach for, in a somewhat of a rational actor sort of way, describing how people choose one of a set of choices to best maximize their utility. And um, uh, vehicle simulators have used that so that you could simulate these cars and try to understand, for example, if we raise the tolls here, what would the impact be, both on our bottom line and, you know, in terms of patterns of movement. Um, if we were to add a street here between A and B, how would that change the flow of traffic? traffic. Um, uh, an agent-based simulator can be a quite, quite useful, um, quite useful in, the, in, in trying to investigate those, those questions. Irregular environments. Yeah. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do. I have models which show how to do that in an agent-based way in any logic, if there were interest, where people move through certain paths right. within the landscape. So it's it's quite easy to do. It's even easier to do in any logic supported discrete event simulation, as we'll see in our sort of glimpse of that, where people move through paths I in a way that's uh, declaratively specified, and it's actually very nicely done. But in both cases, it's it's quite straightforward. It does require for agent-based modeling um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of code writing, but it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so so. Objective maximization has been uh, at the root of some agent-based models, and you know one of the concerns about this is often people make decisions not based on pro uh, maximizing their utility, but based on heuristics, for example. And so it may be overstating rationality to have them simply try to maximize an objective, but it's, it's an approach that's done out there. Um, companies, for companies, profit-seeking might be the objective. So if you had an agent-based model where the agents are companies, you, can, um, uh, you might have maximizing profits driving the decisions. Um, okay, so there's a fur further phenomenon of lear learning. How do behavioral rules, how do these rules, which may depend upon, upon the environment, change? How does an agent select different rules based on their experience? based on their observed experience or their history of encounter, how are they going to change the rules uh, by which they behave? Each of those rules may itself depend on the environment, but they may change their rules. Um, so for example, based on trust, the violation of trust from an individual. An individual may change from a very cooperative mode to a very sort of standoffish, uh, hesitant, wary mode. Um, so you, know, you might have learning from experience as well in, in healthcare facilities. So if someone's encounter with the healthcare system is adverse, they might, that might affect their, um, how, under what rules they decide to go to the facility, present to the facility in the future. Um, so, so there's a class of agent-based models that are quite interesting, which make use of genetic programming um, to sort of evolve through uh, an analogy to the genetic um, uh, mutation process, rules by which agents uh, explore in their neighborhood around them. So agents hybridize rules, for example, and, uh, and develop novel rules to interact. Um, I would note that, and this is, this is something that's not obvious, but um, Traditional uh, aggregate stock and flow models represent a population using a series of cross-sectional sort of results over time. 
We're not tracking individuals within that. We're not tracking individuals within that stock and flow model. So we may have some aggregate level of infection within a population, a certain chance per year that someone's infected. But we're not tracking whether it's the same people getting infected again and again and again, or whether it's, uh, you know, on average people are infected only once. It's a broader segment of the population getting infected. That's really not something you can readily do in an aggregate model. Track individuals and track individual history. Here you can do it. So you can have people's decision making in people's behavior, in people's choice of behavioral strategies depend on their history. And you can have their treatment. The interventions that are undertaken upon them depend on their history, which is important. Okay, we had talked some about other, uh, about forms of interaction, interaction between agents. Um, there can be direct interaction with other agents or they can be indirect, such as through resources. So one deer may interact with another directly through um, mating or through butting heads or, or exhibiting other deer-like behavior of great richness. Um, or, or they can, sorry, I'm not a vet, so I can't, I can't comment in detail on, on the, the variety of their, uh, their uh, repertoire. But um, uh, they can also act, uh, interact, interact uh, indirectly interact, such as through a, a shared resource. So they can deplete vegetation for another deer, for example. Um, they can deposit prions, which are then picked up by different deer, what have you. Generally, our concern is foremost on the direct side. These indirect ones kind of can automatically come out just by how deer interact with, say, the environment, um, how the agents uh, depend on those resources. Um, Okay, um, and we're just about done with these set of uh, set of issues here. Um, we're thinking about, but there's this notion of a collective, and I mentioned this last time, but I, I just want to touch on it again. So within the deer model, um, within our deer model, we have a uh, a set of higher level constructs that come out. So we have herds. I should, man, I should really show you. I'm tempted to. Let me just see if, if I had it. Ah, there we go. Um, so I'll, I'll actually load it in because you'll actually be able to see these here. Okay, so uh, here in, we're in this list with a different version of any logic, but I think it should run just fine. Um, uh, here we have a uh, landscape of deer. So here's the mule deer um, uh, depicted in a stylized fashion um, <laughs> by students who are also not veterinarians. Um, that nose looks awfully big to me, but uh, maybe it's Rudolph. Um, okay, uh, so here what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, social grouping. So this model actually influence, um, has deer uh, be attracted to, to others. Um, and uh, what you'll see is that there are groups of deer that, that travel together. Um, one of them just died. Um, <laughs> And they're, they're kind of grouping. Here's another another group that's traveling. Those are, those are what we might know as as herds. Um, and it's it's actually rather different from the atomistic behavior you get. Um, and we can keep track, by the way, of our prions here. Um, so there's some early buildup for prions. And if we were to run this um, in its you know in a faster level, what you'll see is prions building up at those landscapes. What you'll see down below is a map of the um, of the population of deer. What you see is it rose and then it declined. This is the number of infected deer. It was driving a lot of uh, a lot of decline. The only thing you do see is something realistic, um, which is that there's a deer island. Um, in fact, there's I think two deer islands, um, unless this is a deer peninsula. I guess it's a deer peninsula where there just hasn't been enough mixing. Uh oh, the prions are coming over there. Um, but but this is growing without limit. Um, uh, here, so there's um, oh ooh ooh some got to it. I wonder how we got over there. That's interesting. Um, and in any case, uh, uh, here what we have is social groupings. And if we were to run this instead, using purely random movement, where we have sort of atomistic descriptions of individuals, um, uh, you don't. Let me slow this down so that we can we can see their movement. Um, you don't see those sort of groupings. So those groupings are an example of a collective. The herds, as it were, a small, small, um, 
Small groupings are examples of collectives. And the question in, in our models is often, to what degree do we need to reify, to, to capture as a separate agent these groupings? Do we want to represent families as simply linked sets of individuals um, uh, and, and simply use that as a, as a kind of label for a linked set of individuals? Or do we actually want a family as an agent? Is, is a family, does a family have processes of its own that transcend the processes associated with each individual? Um, is there something about a family's history, putting aside the issue of the individuals in it, something about a family's history over time that we want to keep track of? Um, perhaps perhaps uh, family members uh, uh, you know, arrive at different times, um, births occur, perhaps uh, you know, deaths occur, and yet there's a notion of a family that we want to keep track of its size over time, or important family events. Putting aside the issue of the particular individuals who might or might not have been involved with it. So, some models, we capture these as agents in and of themselves. In some models, we just treat it as a label for a collection of individuals. So, herds within that CWD model are purely an emergent phenomenon. They're not reified as an agent. There's no information, no processes which take place at that level. And at other times, we want to capture them as an agent. So farms, for example, in that hierarchical model I showed, it's an agent unto themselves. They, they include a bunch of animals, but they are not defined purely as those animals. They, ha they may have processes of their own, they may have state of their own. So, so that's, uh, when it comes to a model, when you're thinking about collectives of interest, like herds or like uh, families, um, beyond the individuals and the individual deer, you want to be thinking about, okay, do I need to make this an agent? Or should I leave it not as an agent? Either way is fine. The key question is, are there processes and are there state or aspects of properties of it you want to keep track of? History, for example. Finally, there's this issue of observer processes we talked about there earlier. Um, what, what information do we want to collect? It's typically epiphenomenal. It's not affecting the model, but it's information from the model for our understanding. Okay, um, final component of ODD. So these were some of the things that were on that sheet I handed out, and I just wanted to, to give my sort of perspective on them. The final component of ODD is details. And uh, here we have um, three broad things that are often included. One is initialization. Where does the initial state of the model come from? In a system dynamics model, we have to specify the initial state, and we do that by specifying one. How do we specify the initial state of the system on this model? The stock and flow model. Initial value of the stocks. Yeah. Stocks characterize the state of the system. Within an agent based model, what we're typically talking about state, we're talking about the state of the agents and maybe some state of the environment. Um, you know, we've got to ask ourselves where does that come from? Is it initial? Uh, is, it, is it randomly chosen? Is it significant? Sometimes what we do, and we do this in, in system dynamic stock and flow models too, we want to we want to have a state, uh, an initial state, but it's not particularly privileged, and we run the model out long enough that the influence of that initial state disappears. We call that a burn-in period within agent-based modeling, within a lot of stochastic modeling. Um, within uh, within system dynamics modeling, you speak about equilibration for a stock and flow model. So you run it out far enough that it doesn't matter what the initial state was. And then you run the model forward from there. And that's sometimes done. In other cases, we care a lot about the initial state. We want to ask how many people are vaccinated initially. How does that affect the outcome of an outbreak, for example? And we care a lot about that initial state. So choosing it is something we do with weight, with, with, with import. Um, so that's one thing. Any input data? Are there time series used for a model? Um, models. Uh, I have some issues with the ODD protocol. I think this is best sort of talked about with, with um, discussion parameters and so on. But fundamentally, are you, are you depending on any exogenous time series for this model? You want to specify that somewhere. And then finally, submodels. So often in our description of the processes earlier, we'll make broad terms of use. So we'll talk about partner change process. And we want to find what that is. Submodel defines, okay, 
What is the process of partner chain turn? How does a deer go to drink? What does it do? So the deer periodically wakes up and it says, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Maybe it depends on temperature, how quickly it becomes thirsty. And maybe it depends whether it's giving a class. Um, man, I'm thirsty. Um, and, and then it has to go to drink. Well, what does it mean to go to drink? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's, what's the details of that process by which it goes to drink? What's the details of the process by which it has to find food? How does it accomplish that? And so we specify that within submodels. Um, and then we might test those submodels, actually, uh, independently. OK. Um, so um, that was the last component of the ODD specification. And um, I think I will uh, just, just comment that um, when it comes to the remaining of the process, uh, there'll be a set of issues we'll talk about in separate lectures. One is calibration. Uh, calibration process for used for agent-based models has a lot in common with that used for stock and flow models. And the basic issue here is often we don't have reliable information on some parameters of the model. Um, and yet we do have information often on the output of the model, of, of, uh, of sort of different patterns that, that emerge from the pattern or, or from the system we're trying to, uh, trying to study. And what we'll often try to do is to, to adjust parameters that are less well known to best match the observed data. We try to get it to best match the data we see from the world using parameters whose values are less known. And we try to arrive at reasonable guesses for those parameters. So we tune the values in a process to try to best reproduce um, that data. And um, often the models it has an emergent process that gives rise to that data and we try to match it to what's observed from the world. So it tries to help us find a, a quite specific dynamic hypothesis that explains the data. And it helps us leverage what is often a very large amount of diffuse information that we have at our disposal. Information that can't by itself, a piece of it by itself can't define the value of a parameter, but collectively it constrains the possible values of our parameters. And it helps us falsify our models. So a single model, we're seeking to match many data sources. Um, so in calibration, as we'll talk about in a separate lecture, we have to specify a bunch of information, what to match, what patterns, what parameters to vary, and characteristics of the tuning algorithm. And then we sort of adjust parameters in this parameter space. The issue here in an agent-based modeling context <coughs> is that we have stochastics in our model. So the model doesn't give deterministic results. It doesn't give the same results every time, even for the exact same position and parameter space. Even for the exact same assumptions about the parameter values, the model will give different results every time we run it with a different random number seed. So in calibrating in agent-based models, we have to be extra cautious to attributing the goodness of the match to appropriateness of the parameters. We want to run the model again and again and again to, to get confidence that it's actually a good match. Um, so a given model, for example, might exhibit, this is, this is a, a system dynamics stock and flow model of, of TB, and this is a model that's mathematically um, makes the same assumptions, it just it includes stochastic. And what we see is there's actually quite a lot of variability here around this mean. Mathematically, uh, they are almost identical, except one includes stochastics, the other doesn't. It includes stochastics in whether someone's infected or not. It's a matter of chance. And you can get significant variability. It is around the original, um, original point in this case, because they're mathematically identical. And so we have to reason statistically about confidence uh, with which we are, um, the degree of confidence we can bring to the quality of the match. Um, so we try to run it enough times that we can tightly bound, uh, tightly bound the, uh, the estimates of sort of what the, the mean value from the, from the agent-based model is. Okay, there's a set of techniques for model testing, which are broadly similar to those in system dynamics. 
classic system dynamics model with units and dimensions, dimensional analysis. Uncertainty analysis involving examination of how a model changes when we change its parameters and robustness analysis. Um, how, does, how does the structure of the model, uh, if we change that, to what degree does it change our results? Mm. I'm going to, to leave this. And in these later phases, we're doing policy evaluation, examining the impact of changes to assumptions uh, within a model, counterfactuals, things that aren't, we don't have data from the world, but we're trying to see what the model will project forward um, if we make those assumptions. So we have different scenarios and we compare those scenarios over time. And we're gonna have variability in results in a way that we typically don't with a deterministic stock and flow model. And finally, in the final phase, which is undervalued in, in agent-based modeling, we have knowledge translations, attempt, uh, attempts to bring up learning environments from these things. And in the agent-based modeling context, this is trickier because of the large amount of computational power that's required to execute these models. We may have a model that requires minutes to execute, in some cases hours to execute, and often we'll run it, want to run it many times before showing the results. There have been attempts to pre-run models and to quickly show results from previously run models um, when, you, when you request certain scenarios be run to allow for interactive feedback. But generally speaking, this is an area where, where classic stock and flow models, because of their computationally frugal character, the fact that you don't have as many moving parts, you can actually execute things here much more quickly. And it's underexplored space for agent-based models. So this is, ladies and gentlemen, is the broad space of agent-based modeling. In the later half of today, after our break, what we're going to be doing is we're going to build up, we're going to shift gears totally. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, I can confidently say is about the most boring lecture you'll get in this course. Um, we're going to build up, uh, following this, a simple model uh, from scratch, um, simple network model where people are uh, are put together in, in networks and we have a visual depiction of it. And we're gonna work over time to enrich this model with heterogeneity, with a uh, spread of, of uh, uh, some sort of phenomenon such as infection across the network. And we'll work on um, uh, examining the impact on models of things like mobility and, um, and uh, how we end up uh, getting output from models and, and putting input into a model. So we've covered a lot of the conceptual basis for agent-based modeling. From now forward, it's largely hands-on um, and with some, some focuses on particularly tough issues like on the calibration front, which, which raise some, some strong challenges. So um, I'm gonna request that we have a 10 minute break and we'll then reconvene uh, with your any logics to build up a simple networked model. If anyone is still having issues getting any logic onto their machines, please come up and talk with me and I'll see if I can work with you to, uh, to, to make sure you have a running version of any logic because we'll be needing it today in future, future sessions. Oh, um, you know, we had one last time that someone brought and um, was it Jerome? Uh, okay, um, I will see if I can get the course secretary from now on as well to uh, see if she can find a source for them Great. because this is a computationally demanding course and everyone's going to run out except for me, <laughs> <laughs> which does not lend itself to interaction. So yeah, that sounds good. Why don't we uh, uh, why don't we see what we can find? Chris, do you have access to the website? No, not yet. Okay, yeah, and I have not. I checked my spam filter. Have not heard anything from. Me. Okay. Um, so I sent you the name of the course secretary, you bet is. Yeah, I have not had a chance to, to talk with her. I will. Yeah. Um, just trying to think, because it seems that, maybe, maybe we can look at it right now. Um, is there anyone else in here who's not, who has uh, logged into Stellar from a non-MIT account? Yeah. Okay. So what happened to give you access? So wait, do you use a password or anything like that? Yes. So where, where does your password come from? Uh, at some point I... Maybe like make a uh, ID for non-MIT. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 when you set it up, does it do my question of one button? I can use my ID for my password. That's like a stellar... 
Okay, that's like that's good news. Thank you very much. Okay. There's different classes of people in the class. Right. So you probably added people as like a guest, but guests don't have access to the homework based on the settings. The Got it. But I can set it. I can override that so they do have access exactly. to the homework. Okay. Um, I'm on the case. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see what I can get. The so. Things you learn by being a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great. Um, unfortunately, the things. You don't learn unless you have a TA, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's, um, Chris, does that mean you can see other things on the website? Um, you know, like, in other words, can I? You, you, could, you could go in there and you could see that the, there I is homework. little tabs on the left for like homework and other yeah. categories. Yeah. And when I clicked on those, I know I clicked on homework, I thought I clicked on the other ones, I'm not quite sure, but then it just didn't get me anywhere. Got it. It asked me for a password oh, that I just didn't have. Okay, I'm wondering though if it could be because of that phenomenon that was just mentioned. So, mm -hmm. um, let me let me go see. Oh, so yeah, go to membership. membership. And then user okay. And then access control. Yeah. And then. Uh, um, edit okay, edit participants. Uh, so maybe I'll just yeah edit participants. Okay, I added, Chris has been added as a user. See how he's a provisional then? Yeah. So that's probably the problem. I've never seen that. That's probably why he can't get access. He has an MIT account though too. It's also possible that I just didn't know to use it. It didn't oh. occur to me that. Oh. He, he has an MIT account. So, I don't know about you. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. It's more So can you request a Kerberos account? Yeah, but you can create a mailing list that forwards to any other email. But that wouldn't have a, a password no, assist. No, no, no. We'll go back up to the top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so go back to membership. Membership. And should I do access control? Yeah. So, so that sounds more plausible. The problem is it looks like it's on a site level, like it's for the entire site. Um, and um uh, Oh. Oh, okay. Here we go. So this is what guests have. Guests can view all class materials except for follow-up. This is everything. Yeah, and see how Todd is here? So Todd is here as a guest. So you need to put Todd as a member rather than a guest. Okay, so how do I that that sounds like a great a great idea. Um <laughs> okay, so how do I, so how do I edit participants? And then add here, add user. Okay. Okay, this is what I did. I thought that's how I got Chris Sheldrick. So, so if I do this, and now I, I do edit participants, he's still... I, I I think I added you as your MI. But you added in the guest section. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, your MIT. Bendor. at mit.edu. Because I thought I added it here. Um, but I may be off on that. Uh huh. Okay. So let's go. Let's go to guests. Hey, <laughs> where did it's, it's? I don't know where. Huh? That's weird. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's still. He's still here. Okay. No. Have I? Have I deep six Todd altogether? Okay, oh, 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 okay, so class list? Or edit participants. <laughs> okay, uh. Those are the people really in class. Participants are people who are not really in class, but are kind of in class. So now he's here and he's here. So that's good. But you haven't fixed our shelter. Oh, I see. So he's, he's double listed. 
Yeah, well, oh, well, wait, okay, this is his UNC. Should I, should I, should I get rid of your UNC? Okay. I mean, uh, with, with no, no offense. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, so we, we cleaned up the, that component, but. It seems like he might need to do something to not be a provisional user. That's what I'm wondering, like. Yeah, I thought that's like he would get sent an email and he'd have to validate it or something. Yeah, that's probably because everybody else has an MIT or Harvard account, right? Right. And he has a Gmail account, so he probably has to. It's probably like an MIT recognized person. How long does it take to host a search for an organ right now? To filter through. That's a good question. Um, I got the impression it was instantaneous, but maybe it depends on updating a database which is only done once a day or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I wonder, like, maybe I could add, maybe I'll add <laughs> Chris as an admin. <laughs> okay, still labels you as I could add you as an instructor. <laughs> and then I could sit down and <laughs> take it away, Chris. Um or a TA? I'm gonna add you as a TA. Okay. Um <laughs> so, so that should afford you access to the web, to the homework. You would think, right? Um, you're a grader, though. You see two versions of the website. You have to click, you have to click student view or instructor view. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So make sure you click student view so you can see it. Okay. No, no. Mr. Zhang, um, Shen Zhang, is he is he here? Maybe. maybe. Yeah, because maybe he needs, because he's relegated to guest status right now. Maybe he needs to be promoted to an instructor. <laughs> yeah. So, so Chris, I'm, but I think your question is what password do you use, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a very mechanical sort of thing. Like what, okay, well, where do you get this password from? Um, I, I think also there's probably an email that has to be sent to him. Um, Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, it will. It 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 has significant overlap with that. Yeah. Um, it. No, I don't. I don't think it it goes significantly beyond that. that, that thing. So if you, if you follow that that through, it should be fine. Uh, sorry, I, with the exception of, I, if time allows, I may go on and push on to something that's beyond it. But um, uh, my chances, the good chance, we won't get far beyond it. Okay, and you can you can review the recording. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I found the email, uh, but I asked to be added to the list, and I got an automated email. Right. Okay. Okay, so, so I thought I had done that to Chris. Um, that sounds transgressive. I thought I had done that for Chris, um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm gonna have to uh, go check that. So let's see. What did I, what did I do? Oh, <laughs> okay. I didn't. I didn't mean. To <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Um. Um. Okay. So. Oh, you know, here, okay, um, okay, do I have to, but you see, see it says they will appear until they have activated their account. Oh, so maybe he's supposed to have a, So one thing I could do is I could delete him and then add him, 
I mean, it's not gonna do any harm. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I'm gonna have to delete you from your various roles. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was glorious, however short-lived. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I think I think this this is really the issue. Okay, it seems, Chris, that you have been Oh, okay, there you are. You're still an admin. Okay, let me let me remove you from that from that role. Um okay, I'm still the sole instructor. <laughs> I have control of this module. Um Okay, I'm gonna get rid of Chris as the as a TA. <laughs> And that's a greater too. Okay, now, 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 are you um, Xinjiang? I, I'm Weizhang. Weizhang. Oh, Weizhang. Yeah. Okay, because there's a Xinjiang also. Xinjiang. Let me say, who is this Xinjiang? Oh, he's not me. I'm Weizhang. I'm the actor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's there's uh, there's actually three Jungs. Yeah. Uh, that, that one time is not there. Are you are you Xinjiang? Okay, Si Pei Zhang. Okay, um, and you're Wei Zhang. Yes. And then there's somewhere there's a Xin Zhang. Um, okay, well, well, you know, uh, as as long as he isn't here, he probably won't mind. But um, but we'll await his 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 presence. Um, okay, I want to add now, Chris. I'm going to re-add you. <laughs> okay, let me log out and log back in. Just just. Uh, Yes, yes. Um, um, okay, sure. Click membership. Click membership. Click access control. Access control. Click request an account link on the access control page. Yeah, could it be under... I don't. Can you go back to participants? No, no, just. This one? No, this is. Well, I did that for him before. I'm trying to find a user account request for you. Okay, yeah, I think I saw that. Oh, sir. So, so, so. There we go. There we go. That wasn't there before. That was the. Well, okay. Oh, so the. All's well that ends well. So this one here. But this one says people may register for a collaboration account. So that's presumably not me. Not to suggest I'm not a person, but um <laughs> uh, but but <laughs> but I mean he is not me, right? I don't know, man. Yeah. Well yeah. Can he add students or request collaboration? So maybe you can um can I add students? Well, I don't think I you can that. add a student no, okay. unless you're a TA maybe you can add a student then okay. but let me um let me add Chris in uh so let me let me grab Chris's uh email R Sheldrick uh, I think you can send him that name about you know requesting mm -hmm. sure although I I think I sent that to you in a previous email but but give me just a sec. So one, I'm going to specify two email addresses for you um, to thwart any spam bots. Uh, so there's rsheldrick at Tufts, and then there's at gmail.com. Same, same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I'll I'll do add new. So you had a question? You yeah. need my signature? Yeah, need okay. I'll you don't mind. I mean yeah. Yeah. Sure. Easy, where Where is it? Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. There we go. Um. Okay, so uh, great. Um, submit. Okay, here it goes. Look at that. All right, look at this. Exciting. Okay, <laughs> will be added to this as a provisional user. MIT Touchstone Collaboration Code will be requested for them on my behalf. In order to access this site, they will have to activate their collaboration account. Please verify the email address below. Um, 
and I guess I have to do submit, right? And okay, no, I I noticed two provisional users. Oh, those are for each of yours. So maybe you got two emails. Oh, so, so you're, 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 you're Mr. You're the third Mr. John. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Um, that, that's great. Uh, I. It, it beats me. Um, let's. Can I go delete you and um, with no offense, and then I'll add you. Oh, no problem. Add, add you back in. Okay. I think you're listed as a as. Okay. So I I need to do access control. And then I need to delete you. Okay. okay. Um, and then. Okay. Now no one's listed. Um, okay. And then I need to do membership. And then I think I just need to do edit. Oh. Oh. No, I didn't want to do that. Um, okay. So I just want to add you as a okay. participant, right? Yep. And okay. Uh, Xinjiang yep. at mit.edu. Yep. Okay, and then I'm going to do submit. Hey. Hmm? Okay. Cool. Um, and let's just see if you're a guest still. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, I think I think not, but but let's just verify. Yes, no one is a guest. No. <laughs> okay. So Chris, hopefully you'll receive an email. Still isn't. Oh, yeah, it's 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 possible. I mean, Stellar used to have a it, it was a it had issues. Um, and it used to only update the user database like once a day or something like that. And so it's possible to be delayed by a day. Um, one time I sent mail to students through it while it was in the middle of updating the database, and only some of them got the mail and some didn't. It was non-transactional. It was very disturbing. It works. It works? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, so we are now going... Okay, so we are now going to uh, begin the second part, and we're going to build up a uh, sample model from scratch. Right. Um, I wonder if. 